Does this circuit really convert capacitance to inductance, as is shown here? If this is true, what this is trying to say is when you look at and try to find input impedance from uh, the port AB view, that Zn, according to this, uh, looks like and feels like a inductance. And effectively, if this is true, we can realize high Q inductor in a reasonable range, in a practical range, using a circuit that doesn't have any inductor. It just has two ideal op amps and two capacitors. So somehow this circuit is converting capacitance to inductance, if this is true. Let's see. To, uh, to do this, we need to, uh, to do a quick circuit analysis. And I'm going to move this to here so that I have enough space. Now, let's find Zn to see whether that is true or not. To find Zn, I need to state this. Zn, by definition, is I apply a test voltage at input, which is VAB, between the two uh, terminals of port AB. Let's just say VAB is equal to V. Uh, from now on, all the voltages I'll talk about, voltage of any node in this circuit, would be with respect to reference node B. So Zn is VAB or V divided by IN. IN is the fact that when I apply V or VAB, as a result of that, a current IN flows through this circuit, which of course this current IN cannot go through the input in, uh, terminal of ideal op amp because it has infinite impedance. That IN has to go through the variable resistor or potential meter with value R that you see here. So uh, if this node has a voltage V, and if this node has a voltage Vx at the output of the second op amp, all I can say is this is my Zn. I need to find In as a function of V. But in the meantime, In is simply V minus Vx divided by that variable resistor R. OK. Now, let's make the assumption that the two op amps here are properly biased. By that, I mean the supply voltages are properly connected so that these op amps are not in saturation. They are in linear region of operation. They have a proper negative feedback so that they are stable. Now, if that is, the, if that is true, virtual short is valid for each op amp, virtual short, which means, as a result, uh, the voltage at positive input terminal equal to voltage at the negative input terminal for each op amp. So if you have V here, that V also appears at negative input terminal, appears at the output because of the way it's connected, like a buffer. And that V will be here as well. Again, the V is with respect to node B, reference node. OK, nothing can flow through the input terminals of op amp because these are ideal ones with infinite input impedance. So if there is a current that going through C2, that current has to go through R2 and R3 in series. Therefore, I can find the voltage at positive terminal of the second op amp using just the voltage division between C2, series of R2 and R3. So voltage at, uh, for op amp number two at positive input terminal, of course, because of virtual short, is the same voltage for op amp number two at input net terminal equal to a voltage division between series of R2 and R3 R3 is a variable resistor or potential meter, divide by R2 plus R3 and plus the impedance of cap 2, which is 1 over C2S, times V. OK, great. So I found V. And of course, I also know now that V2 for negative at this point is the value that is shown here. OK, great. So remember, this node is voltage up and to positive input terminal. All right, whatever current flowing uh, through R1, because it can't go through the input terminal of up amp, it has to go through C1, as if R1 and C1 are in series. And therefore, because of this fact, I can compute this current. And from there, I can compute uh, Vx voltage that I need. So let's put it this way, then. I can say. Uh, Vx is equal to voltage op amp 2 negative input terminal, meaning this point, minus the current I don't know, but I can compute. So minus this, let's say, current I, so minus I, times, uh, of course, uh, V2 minus, uh, minus the voltage drop across this cap with this polarity. So it is I times the impedance of this cap, which is simply 1 over C1S. OK, 
But this current is just V minus V2 at negative input terminal divided by R1. So let's do that. V2 negative minus 1 over C1S times current uh, is uh, V minus V minus V2 negative input terminal divided by resistor R1. Okay, all right. So the nice thing is I also know already from the above equation, this one, that uh, V2 is related to V like this. So I'm going to substitute for V here using this equation. So in summary, I can just write it this way. I can write Vx is equal to. OK, so uh, I have V2 minus here and uh, plus 1 over C1 R1s V2 minus. So I can just do it this way. Um, I can do 1 plus 1 over R1 C1 S times um, V2 minus, and V2 minus is this value, so R2 plus R3 divide by uh, R2 plus R3 plus 1 over C2S, okay, times V, um, times V, of course, but let's keep that V for now, for a second, and what else do I have? I have 1 over uh, minus 1 over C1 S R1 times V. So minus 1 over R1 C1 S. And the whole thing now multiplied by V, which is the input voltage. OK, great. So I found Vx actually in this formula. And all I need is I can compute my I in. So my I in is equal to here, 1 over R times V minus Vx. So V minus what you see here. And as a result, I can just say 1 <coughs> plus 1 over R1 C1S, because I have to say V minus this. Minus, minus become 1 plus, minus 1 plus 1 over R1 C1S times R2 plus R3 times divide by R2 plus R3 plus 1 over C2S and this whole thing multiplied by V. Okay, so all I'm tra trying to find is V over IN. So I do a little just manipulation here. So as a result of that, what I get is V over I in is equal to, so V over I in is equal to R goes to the numerator, the other side, divide by, so maybe I put it this way, R times, or let's say R divide by, okay, so R divide by, and in denominator, I have a bunch of things. This whole thing goes to denominator. But rather than pushing it into the denominator, maybe easier one to just write is just say R times this whole thing to the power negative one. Because I am moving this whole thing. By this whole thing, I mean I am moving this whole stuff into the denominator of the other side of the equation. So that I can have V divided by I in equal to R divided by this thing. So this thing here, I'm going to just... Uh, uh, right, rewrite it, but I'm going to simplify as far as I can. So what I have is this simplification. I have, um, looks like I can factor out 1 plus R1 uh, C1S. So let's do that. 1 plus 1 over R1 C1S. You have it here, you have it here. And then um, 1 minus 
this guy. But 1 minus that, I can write it this way. I can write it R2 plus R3 plus, um, let's say, 1 over C2S, or um, let, me, let me put it a step by step, because otherwise it will be questionable. Okay, so I said 1 minus, because I factored out this guy and this guy, so 1 minus this whole thing, but this whole thing is R2 plus R3 times C2S divide by R2 plus R3 times C2S plus 1. And this whole thing is to the power of negative 1 because it is in denominator. Okay, now I can do one final round of simplica simplification. This thing including 1 minus this, we compute it, and you end up with uh, this outcome. So you end up with this outcome. R times, um, and I get um, 1 plus 1 over R1 C1S. And you know what? Let's actually also simplify that in this form. So 1 plus R1 C1S divided by R1 C1S times. If you simplify this thing, what remains will be only 1 over 1 plus R3 or R2 plus R3, R2 plus R3, C2, S, and you have minus 1. Okay, so what is the nice thing about this? Uh, you know what? Here, as you can see, the resistor R3 is a variable resistor, is a potential meter. I can adjust it. So the beauty of this circuit is if it is properly designed, then I can change this R3 and set it in such a way that R2 plus R3 shown here is equal to, is, is satisfying an important requirement. So let's put it this way. Uh, by properly setting the variable resistor R3 in such a way and by selecting the C2 and C1 in such a way that um, R2 plus R3 times C2 times C2 is equal to R1 C1. So let's make the assumption by uh, why we can do this. I mean, the, nobody is stopping us because we have the choice of properly inserting and selecting C1 and C2. And also we have the choice of properly adjusting the value of R3. It's a potential meter such, in such a way that this is satisfied. If that is the case, then the nice thing that happened is uh, this goes away. So this one goes away and uh, by this one. So is they are equal to each other. So as a result, what, what remains inside this uh, closed bracket with the power negative 1 is just simply 1 over R1C1S. And then to the power negative 1 becomes just simply R1C1S. So if that is true, then Zn which is just V divided by I n. So Z n, which is V divided by I n, is equal to R times R1 C1 S, 1 over R1 C1 S with the power negative 1, which is times R1 C1 S. OK, so what is the nice thing about this outcome? Obviously, you can see. It is. Uh, it has. It has really an inductance uh, impedance behavior because it is some value times s, like ls. So you have an inductor implemented this way. Z in really uh, assuming this condition is satisfied, which is easy to do, then z looks like really is in the form of ls, uh, and the value of that can be adjusted nicely using uh, the potential meter you have in this circuit. So remember this R, I'm going to put it there. So this R 
is input, not input, this R is this one, right? It is the one that you can really adjust because you have a potential meter there. You can adjust the value of this L by changing R. So once you set R1C1 to satisfy this requirement here, the next thing you can adjust is this R. So I'm going to highlight. This is your inductance, effective inductance, in which we can adjust it even with the R. So not only you're realizing an inductance uh, in this circuit, but also it's a variable inductor in which the value of it could be easily adjusted by this potentiometer or variable resistor here. So yes, in conclusion is we got to the point that Zn is L times S and L is variable. So variable inductance realize with high Q. I hope that this video is helpful.